came home, I was trying to to read a lot about our Lakota ways, our Lakota culture, and I remember a friend of mine who is very much a believer in our oral history. He told me, I think I picked up a book somewhere, and I was carrying it around with me. And at this time, we were both in education. And I remember my friend telling me, he says, why are you reading that book? You should be listening to the oral history of our elders. And I really felt bad because I, I, I uh, he was right. But I also was, want, I was thirsty for knowledge, and I wanted to learn more. And I've always been a student. And then I came across this book called Soldiers Falling Into Camp. And it was co-authored by our, our guest here tonight, our, our guy here from South Dakota. And I took that book back to my friend. I said, this one was written by one of us. Can I read this one? <laughs> and you know what? That's what Joseph represents for the Lakota, Dakota, Nakota people of our area and of all of Indian country. It's really time for us to get our voice back as Indian people. We have to write a new narrative from our perspective. And Joseph represents that in his writings. And for a young, impressionable, recent college graduate, I cannot tell you the impression that Joseph made of my life. And, uh, you know, what we are missing a lot these days for our young Indian people, our role models. And Joseph fits the bill for that. He certainly was one of my role models. You know, one of the things I like about Joseph's book, Crazy Horse, which by the way, uh, when Joseph came to the governor's residence for the first ladies event a couple weeks ago, over 200 state employees came out to attend that event. And they had a lot of interesting questions, didn't they, Joe? And, uh, and I'm really thankful to you because in my work, I'm always trying to find ways to create dialogue. And Joseph created some dialogue that I hope that we keep going in the coming months uh, and throughout my work. But it's important to have that dialogue about our history. Our history as Indian people, our history as a state, and our culture that we share. And I appreciate Joseph's work for that reason. So without any further ado, let me just share a few things that I know about Joseph and reading about him. You know, I know that he grew up on the Rosebud Reservation, and his wonderful family is here tonight. I got to meet your mother earlier, Joseph, a wonderful lady. And I know that Joseph was brought up in his traditional ways, raised by his maternal grandparents. And if any of you have spent any amount of time with your grandmother, uh, your grandmother really has a way of teaching you things that you don't forget. And I know Joseph has had a lot of those things stamped on his life and it comes out in his writings. But most importantly, he carries on a very vital tradition in our Lakota life, and that is the tradition of storytelling. And um, in addition to that, Joseph has gone on in his career prior to becoming a writer. He was an educator, and he came down to our education summit that was sponsored by the Department of Education and uh, had a wonderful visit with our, our the people that came to that conference and talked about the history of education. And I was invited to the conference, and as I was heading to the conference, I was so afraid that Secretary Shop was gonna have me say a few words, so I jotted down some ideas, and one of the questions I had was, I'm gonna talk to them about what is Indian education? And then when I got to the conference, there was Joseph, explaining to everybody for about an hour a history of Indian education and what it was, how it evolved over the years. And so his background as an educator is so important and having a, a, a knowledge of that history. I think another thing that contributes greatly to Joseph's writing is the fact that he has a history working in tribal government. He has that background. He understands the needs of our people. And he understands it from a historical standpoint, from a policy standpoint, and, uh, and even uh, going all the way back to when we came on the reservations to the current 
day. He brings these things in his writings. And one of the things I think is really interesting about Joseph is that he does archery, traditional archery. He makes traditional bows, traditional arrows. And it's, uh, it's one of those, again, another one of those traditions that we've had that is being lost. One of the things I really appreciate about Joseph is the fact that he's a fluent Lakota speaker. Another art among our people that is being lost, the language. And he's going to share some of that language when he gets up here, I'm sure, with you. And I tried to share some tonight. And if I mispronounce something, please forgive me, Grandma. But I, I always try to share my language and I get up to speak to people. Because having our language alive is important. There are three things that make us who we are as Lakota, I believe. And one of them is our language. The other one is our land. And the other one is our traditions. Joseph has a lot of good writings. He has some new ones coming out. And, um, but I think one of the things that, as he mentioned on uh, in his biography, is uh, his most treasured experiences was being a part of the founding board of Sintagalishka. Sintagalishka University continues to contribute to the education of young people on the reservation. Here's some applause the back. So he brings that as well. And uh, his contributions are still being felt down there in the Rosebud community. So without any further ado, I could go on and on. I just feel like doing cartwheels because I get to introduce him. I've been talking about this all week, by the way, Joseph. Every I, I went around, I've been going around to different places. I got to speak at a school this week. I got to speak up at SDSU, and I've been telling everybody, I'm going to Deadwood on Saturday, and I get to introduce Joseph Marshall. It is indeed my honor, sir, to introduce you. And so without any further ado, ladies and gentlemen, I present to you Joseph Marshall III. If you want to know what I just said, you can ask my mom. It was polite. Thank you for being here. I know that you all came from Buffalo Field. It's nice of you to stay on. I'll try to be as entertaining as the Buffalo was good. Thank you to the South Dakota Humanities Council. Thank you, GR, for that very, very kind introduction. It's a pleasure and an honor for me to be here, especially because of the journey of Crazy Horse. I was surprised and pleased and honored that that book was chosen as One Book South Dakota. I didn't quite believe it when I first got the news. And as the days went on after that, uh, I began to realize how special it was, not just for me and the book, but for Lakota, Dakota, and Nakota heritage and culture, that you, South Dakota Humanities Council, picked that book as, as the one book read. I'll always be grateful for that, and it's an honor I'll always treasure. So thank you for that. I looked at tonight's program, and it said uh, lecture. But uh, in order to lecture, one has to know something. I don't know anything, but I do know a little bit about storytelling. So I thought maybe I'd tell you a few stories and give you an insight into, not Crazy Horse, because you can read the book to do that. That's what I wrote the book for. But how it came to be. So in a sense, um, this is a story of the journey of the journey of Crazy Horse. And as you can see, the shirt up here, made by Kathy Smith, who is a first-rate costume designer and has worked in television series and movies. A wonderful job that she did uh, making replica of a shirt that we believe once belonged to Crazy Horse. And I'd like to thank Kathy for that. And I'd like to thank my mom for being here. And my family, I think that's about half of you in this whole audience. Thank you for being here. And to my wife and partner, Connie.
1975, I was going through a period when I was trying to decide how I was going to go about being a writer, or if I was going to be a writer. I was working at, with the Rosemont Sioux Tribe. I had a very interesting and challenging job as the community liaison to the tribal president. And I was in a bit of a turmoil. I wanted to be a writer. I wanted badly to be a writer, be a storyteller. But I, I knew that it would take a lot more dedication and effort than, than I knew about. One evening, I was driving to White River from Mission on Highway 83. And I was a few miles south of White River in that Horse Creek community area, for those of you who know it. It was an evening, dusk. And I saw, and, and those of you who are from that part of the country know there are, there are some sloping hills on the east as you're going north. And I saw three riders coming down the hill in my peripheral vision. And I really wasn't paying attention to them, only that I was aware that they were there. And I, I sort of expected they would stop at the gate or at the fence and find a way to go around it or find the gate and then go through it. But they didn't. They rode through the fence, like it was, was not even there. And then to my complete surprise and shock, when they came to the highway, and the highway was higher than the, the, the prairie around it, they rode through the highway. And all I could see of them was from the chest on up. They went through the roadbed, across the other side, through the fence again, without stopping. And it was then that I noticed how they were dressed. All three of them had very long hair and were not using saddles. They were riding essentially bareback. And they blended into the trees toward the river. And then they were gone. Now I know some of you have had experiences like that. Maybe some of you think those kind of things don't happen. Well, I'm here to tell you, they do. But that particular incident happened at a time when I was in a bit of a turmoil about writing. And as far as I was concerned, that was a message. Those three writers, as far as I was concerned, were connected to the past. I think they came from the past to show me the path I was to follow. So in one moment, I decided I would take a chance and pursue the career of writing. Little did I know what it really took to do that. It was not just the creative side, it was also the business side of writing as well. By 1990, I had published several books. And my family and I were in LA, we were, uh, I had adapted a young adult novel into a screenplay, and we were trying to uh, make it into a movie, which never really happened, but it was an interesting experience nonetheless. And my agent at the time had managed to get appointments for me in New York with several publishers. We had prepared a very elaborate proposal for a nonfiction book called Let the Wind Blow Through You. Let the Wind Blow Through You eventually became a lot for the way. But that particular January, uh, we were in, in LA, and uh, my agent called and said, I've, I've managed to get some appointments for you in New York. Can you go there? So we somehow managed to piece together enough miles from Connie's frequent flyer miles, and I went to New York from LA. And when I got to LA, it was nice and warm. Uh, when I went, got to New York, it was nice and warm in LA, but colder than heck in New York. And I had an appointment to see four publishers. And I was greeted by my agent's friend, an escort, who took me to all these publishers. And then later on, I figured out she was just there to make sure I was on my best behavior. That I sat up straight, that I said, yes, ma'am, no, sir. Use a napkin at lunch, that sort of thing. Act civilized, as it were. So we visited four publishers. We started at 9 o'clock in the morning, and we got we were finished by 4 o'clock in the afternoon. 
new. And I made the same pitch over and over and over again. But let the wind blow through you. What is what it was about? Traditional stories and commentary about life and so forth. And there was no way to tell whether I had made the sale, whether I had made any kind of impression on those publishers. So the next morning, I got back on an airplane to head back to Los Angeles. And unbeknownst to me, while I was in the air, a bidding war started between two publishers for this book. While that was going on, my wife Connie suggested to my agent that she also include the idea for a book on Crazy Horse. Now the first book, Let the Wind Roll Through You, had an elaborate 10 page proposal. We had to work hard for months on that proposal, putting it together, making sure it was just right. Crazy Horse was just an ad. Connie said to the agent, just tell the publishers that he also wants to write a book about Crazy Horse. And the agent resisted. She said, no, it'll, it'll never happen, it'll never sell. Publishers don't like that sort of thing. Connie insisted. The agent said to the publishers, and oh, by the way, Joe also wants to write, Joseph also wants to write a book about Crazy Horse. When I landed in LA, Connie and I went to coffee. And one of the first things she told me was that we sold your books. And I said, books. Yes, Crazy Horse as well. So without any kind of proposal, Crazy Horse became a reality. And I think that happened because it had its own energy. I think that the story of Crazy Horse needed to be told by a Native person. But the story didn't end there. As I started to work on the Lakota Way, I remembered the people who inspired me to write. Those people like Dr. Charles Eastman, um, one of the first Lakota, Lakota writers. Luther Standing Bear, who's another who published four books back in 1928. Virginia, Dragon Hawks Navy, who was writing children's books at the time, and Vine Gloria Jr. Those, were, those people were my inspiration. So I thought about them as I prepared to start working on these books. And by the way, I don't think anybody can come up with a better title than Custer Guide for Your City. So I waded through the, the, the manuscript that eventually became the Lakota Way. Um, as, as you writers know, we have no input on what the title is going to be and what the cover art is going to look like. And that's the way it turned out. Even though I put in my two cents worth before Let the Wind Go Through You, the title eventually became the Lakota Way Stories and Message for Living, and it came out in 2001. After that, I started to work on Crazy Horse. But now without its problems. I wanted to write it simply as a story, not a scholarly work that would be burdened with footnotes and annotations and a long, long bibliography at the end. I wanted to do it just as a plain story. That didn't go over too well with a couple of people, one of them my agent. So there was some discussion, some argument, because she said that scholars would not accept the book as a serious work if you did not use that scholarly format. So we argued about it, we discussed it, it interfered with the process of writing. After some months went by, I finally took a stand and said I'm going to write it as a story. I really don't give a darn how anybody thinks. So it came out simply as a straightforward story, one that is a mechanism in Lakota culture called the hero story where Lakota people, Lakota storytellers, Lakota families, Lakota communities would tell stories about people in their community, in their families, and their accomplishments, and their deeds. They were not made up stories. They were stories about real people, real members of the family, real people who had lived. And that's the way I wanted to write this book. Um, so, after months of wrangling, we finally agreed on the format. Um, 
And after that, it was easier to write. My editor at Viking Penguin was a very courageous lady by the name of Janet Goldstein. She was the one who bought the two books. And she was behind me totally all the way in how I wanted to write the book. She said, you're the author, it's your story, we'll do it the way you want to do it. So that's why you'll notice at the back of the book, I list only the names of the informants and the people who told me the stories of Crazy Horse in this time. There are no annotations from the author's That's the way I wanted to do it to begin. The structure and the format of the book, as I said, was that of the hero story. And I, I decided that was the only way to tell it because if I was going to, if I was going to use the Lakota voice, that was the only structure that I could use. Needless to say, soon after that I fired my agent. That's another story. <laughs> and I'm pleased to say that after the book was released, it made bags in advance in six months. That's how well received it was. So that sort of was validation for how I wanted to write the book. Um, but just before the book came out, I still had some trepidation as to how the scholarly community would, would accept what kind of criticism the book might receive from that, that aspect of the historical community. We were, we were living in Bismarck, North Dakota at the time, and now it was 2 o'clock in the morning and I was finishing the final rewrites of the manuscript. And I heard thunder rumbling somewhere off to the west. And I kept worrying that whole day, that whole two or three weeks, and it culminated in that, in that night. That thunder somehow felt, sounded very reassuring. And I took it as another message. And as I was sitting there ruminating about the book and how people would receive it, I heard the loudest thunderclap I ever heard in my life brightest flash of lightning I've ever seen in my life. So I thought to myself, okay, that's probably a sign the book is going to be okay. And I didn't worry about it anymore. Several months later, after the book was out, I was driving down Highway 83 in Nebraska in the sand hills. And I was recalling how Crazy Horse, as a, as a young man, had escorted a young Cheyenne woman after the attack on Little Thunder's camp, and they were going through the same place. So I stopped, my car pulled over, and I happened to have some tobacco with me. So I took the tobacco, and I made an offering. And I heard a sound above me, like a jet plane. And as I looked up, I saw this hawk dive just in front of me into the opposite ditch of the highway, grab a snake, and go up. That was another sign as far as I was concerned. Snakes in our culture, to some of us, are signs that is a sign of the enemy. That hawk, that snake, about 100 yards up in the air, they dropped him. So when those kind of things happen, as far as I'm concerned, they were messages that this book probably was meant to be written in a way that would, maybe it wasn't meant to be write, written by me so much, that it needed to be out there. It needed to have that perspective from a Lakota writer. And then, of course, several years later, it gets picked as the South Dakota one book read. And the question is often asked, why did you write the book? And it's a question that sometimes gives me reason to pause. Um, and there are all kinds of ways to answer it, I would guess. Um, and the answer has nothing to do with ego. It has to do with perspective. And I would like to read to you an excerpt from an essay that I wrote back in 1996 that sort of, to me in a way, answers part of the question, why did you write the book? And the, this essay was published in a book called Legacy New Perspectives on the Battle of the Big War. And it was published by the Montana Historical Society Press. 
And it was about the battle and the circumstances of the battle. And this is how I concluded the essay, so bear with me. Many of the mothers and grandmothers and the grandfathers who were far too past their prime to ride into battle, not knowing what the outcome of the battle would be, gathered the young and other helpless ones and fled to safety. Some stayed in, in the camp to be of whatever assistance they could to the fighting men. I have heard stories of wives, mothers, and grandmothers who stood at their lodges holding their sons, husbands, and grandsons' second and third war horses, singing and praying as the battle progressed, knowing full well they were endangering themselves if the enemy should come into the camp. I have heard stories of small boys who had to be physically restrained by their mothers and older sisters to prevent them from sneaking into the fight. And I have heard the same story from several different sources that the defenders who repelled an attempted incursion at Medicine Tail Coulee, crossing, trying to cross the river into the village. Those defenders who repelled, repelled that attempted attempted incursion were mostly old men and boys. In my opinion, the warriors who fought and defeated the enemy that day had a lot of help, and certainly no monopoly on courage and commitment. All of those people who faced that terrible day on the greasy grass are my heroes. Each one who put something on the line that day was defending his or her people, his or her family, his or her way of life. Each one who took any action did so so that the people could live. Each one was a patriot. And in the end, the fact that we lost the so-called class of cultures does not, for me, diminish that patriot. Personally, I am not interested in debating or arguing about greasy grass. I am, however, interested in ways that we can learn the reality of greasy grass and tell the story fairly from all viewpoints. The only way we can do that is to realize that history belongs to all of us. It is not the domain of those who perceive themselves to be the winners to the exclusion of those who are perceived to be the losers. It belongs to all of us because all of our ancestors lived then and we live with it now. Therefore, our collective obligation is to know the reality of history and report it completely with all its victories and defeats, with all of its compassion and brutality. To do anything less would be to deny the humanity of it. So keeping this in mind, this was one of my reasons to, to write the story of Crazy Horse. But, and I can say this, I did not write the book because I, would, I thought I was the ultimate authority on Crazy Horse, because I'm not. I did not write the book because I wanted to correct previous versions or other books on Crazy Horse written by anyone or, or criticize them or because I thought I could do it better. I did write the book for these reasons. I wanted there to be a Lakota perspective, an insider's viewpoint among all the non-Lakota voices who had anything to say about crazy. I wanted to show anyone who cared that we Lakota are capable of telling our own stories, as more and more of us are doing. I wanted to show young Native people and young Lakota people that we are capable of telling our own stories. I wanted to let young Native people 
and especially young Lakota, Dakota, and Nakota people, that we have many things to be proud of as a people. Our real life heroes among them. And perhaps most important of all, I want young Native people, and certainly Lakota, Dakota, and Nakota children and young people, to know that you do not have to find make-believe heroes in the movies, or on television, or in video games. Our heroes are real, as real as we are, as real as you are. Crazy Horse faced difficult things and situations in his life. He was ridiculed for the way he looked at all things. Yet he faced his problems and persevered. And so can we, and so can you. Whatever you face in your lives every day, uncertainty, difficult choices, low expectations, bad days at school, I want you young, young people to know that the same strength that helped Crazy Horse as a young person get through tough times is in you as well. Because he was a real person, just as you are, just as you are. And that is the real reason he is my hero and always will be. Finally, I hope that there are other Lakota voices out there who will add to the story of Crazy Horse and spread the word about our culture and our history. And I know that those of us who have done so and are doing so will continue to do that. And I hope that anyone who has heard our voices, have read our words, will continue to do that as well. So focus on the journey of Crazy Horse over the past few months has been gratifying, but interesting as well. And it's been, um, it's opened a lot of doors to discussion about not just Crazy Horse, but Lakota history and Western American history and Crazy Horse Monument. And those are all things that, that we shouldn't shy away from at all. But since I'm a storyteller, I'm gonna tell you one more story about how I perceive this honor and the attention that it brought. There is, there is a story of a, of a town bum. He had a wife and a son and, and a small house at the edge of town. But he seemed to not be able to hold a job. He would get a job, he would work for a while, then he'd get fired, he'd do something to screw up and he'd get fired. And so over time he established a reputation in the town as not being very reliable. And then one day, he died. So his widow went around to all the ministers in the town to bury her husband. And everybody said, no, I don't want to do that because he was not a very good man. He laid you down. So finally, she went to the last minister in town. And he agreed to do the funeral service. And so on the appointed day of the funeral, a few people showed up. And the casket was up there in front of the church, and, and the minister began to talk about this man who had died and began to eulogize him. At first, he was, you know, a good man. And the more the minister talked, I think it was probably Baptist, the more he worked himself into a frenzy. Now the man was not just a good man, he was a good and faithful husband. He was a hard worker. And then suddenly, the more he talked, he became a pillar of the community and a shining example for all of us. At which point, the widow leaned over to her son and whispered to him, go and see if that's your father in the casket. <laughs> so this whole experience with the one book South Dakota read about Crazy Horse has been interesting, to say the least. 
So in closing, I want to again thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you for coming. Thank you for taking the time to read the book. Not just because I wrote it, but it, becomes, it comes from a perspective among all of those to whom history belongs. It is the story of one group of people among all of us out there. And I tried to do it in a way that was fair. And I tried to do it in a way that was entertaining. I strive to do it in a way that the old storytellers who told me all the stories in my youth would be proud of. I don't know if I succeeded or not. But I am glad that in this year, in this past year, a lot of people have taken up the book. And I'm especially grateful that it was given to young people, young Native people, all over the state. For that, I'm especially grateful. And I just want to say one more word of thanks to my friend, uh, Dave Strait, who is one of my biggest supporters. I don't know where you're sitting, Dave, but thank you for all you've done, and I won't even mention the fact that you live on Custer Street. <laughs> so once again, thank you to Sherry for the South Dakota Humanities Council for putting this perspective from the Lakota culture out there for everybody in South Dakota to see. Thank you very much.